Hey, this morning we're, we're starting a journey, so I want you to look to the person on your left and say, we're starting a journey. And then I want you to look to the person on your right and say, uh, don't say, uh, say, the first step is forgiveness. And then look to somebody else that you really trust and say, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> That's how it goes, isn't it? We all have something that we need forgiven for. Me, personally, this week, I uh, was at Walmart at 6.30 in the morning buying flowers because, you know, it was Valentine's Day. And uh, as, I was, uh, as I was walking through the store and bringing my, my flowers, um, I actually heard a couple of ladies who were just three or four steps behind me. They said, don't you love watching all the guys squirm who forgot about Valentine's Day? <laughs> and I stopped. I didn't know this person from Adam. And I, and I turned around and I said, it was not that I forgot. I, this was pure procrastination. And uh, it was just funny. But, you know, even, even in our most sincere acts of love, sometimes we, we mess up. We don't quite get it right and we need to seek forgiveness. So, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the social media platform Twitter, but I looked up this week, hashtag Valentine's Day fail. And so these are just stories about how others have failed on their Valentine's Day endeavor. The first one is, uh, they tweeted, I ordered from 1-800-Flowers what I ordered versus what they sent. That's a Valentine's Day fail. For my, this is the next one, for my husband's Valentine's Day present, I made a your hot pun in his card. So I got the spiciest Doritos I could find, the Blaze Doritos. They're so spicy, he nearly choked, and he can't even eat them. That's a, that's a Valentine's Day fail. Here's another one. I, I don't have a picture for this one, but uh, anyway, just use your mind's eye. When I was in high school, you could send roses for Valentine's Day. White was for a secret admirer. And so I sent a dozen roses to my crush, my crush, who proceeded to immediately throw them in the trash. That's a Valentine's Day fail. And this is the last one. I think it's really funny. I thought I was being uber romantic by, design, by designing my husband a card with a quote from our favorite movie, Jerry Maguire. It looked perfect online. And then it arrived. You had me at hell. Oh, the O got dropped. That's a Valentine's Day fail. Oh, man. So even in our most sincere acts of love, we can mess up and still need to find forgiveness, right? Right? That's just, that's just how it goes. And, uh, and we live in a messed up, broken world, and that's, that's just the truth of the matter. Unfortunately, and I'm glad we can laugh at these, unfortunately though, at least two or three of those tweets probably caused major fights. Really, you know? And it all started with a sincere act of love. Sometimes we just need forgiveness because we can't keep up with the pace of life. We can't keep up with the hurriedness, with the all that could possibly go wrong. We can't do it. We need a savior. And so this morning, as we dive into the first step, I just, uh, just want to pause and, and recognize something that, that is wrong with the world. We know it's, it's wrong with the world because everybody has an opinion on what's wrong with the world, right? You can't log on to Facebook, watch the news, or even sit down to have coffee with somebody without catching their opinion on how to fix it. In a lot of ways, we're just offering judgment, aren't we? We're not actually being a part of the solution. We're not actually doing what the church has called us to do, right? It's just, it's just interesting. I think the real problem is, the real problem is we're out of balance. Even in the church, we love justice, we love the legalism, and we kind of just maybe seek mercy. We just kind of look after forgiveness. It's an afterthought to us. And, and it, it's just true. But Micah 6.8 offers us a little bit of insight as to how this order is. And you know, as, as we move forward, and Micah is the greatest prophet, by the way. Um, <laughs> as we move forward, though, I, I really want us to consider this, that when we consider forgiveness, we're not just discounting justice. Justice does serve a place in our society today. 
But Micah 6.8 says, do justice. That's part of it. But we're supposed to love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Do you see how much more we are supposed to offer forgiveness, offer mercy, not just do the justice thing? It's a really important balance that I think maybe we've forgotten. And it's, it's because we tend to trap ourselves in the legalism of it. It's easier to uh, follow the 12-step program. It's easier during the season of Lent to say, I'm going to give up pop and feel good about myself at the end of the six weeks. But if we're not replacing that social beverage with a small group discussion, then we're actually not growing any closer to Christ. See, the whole point of fasting, the whole point of giving something up during Lent is actually to fill it with more of God, right? We go, we go back to John Wesley, our founder, who actually fasted most of his ministry. He would skip dinner, uh, he would fast beginning Thursday night, and, uh, bef- and he would not have dinner, and he would not eat again. He would do an absolute fast until Friday night. When the sun went down, he would have another meal, and he would break his fast. He did this every week, and he intentionally when he gave up his mealtime, would seek God through prayer and devotion and community. And so, if you've chosen to give up an hour of TV this, this, uh, this season of Lent, I challenge you, use one of these resources. Get a book. They're at the back, right? There's a Bible reading challenge in the back. There's a Bible reading challenge in your bulletin. Replace that hour of television, even if it's just five minutes at a time this week, with being in the Word, with moving toward closer to God. Get out of the legalistic state of, I did it, check mark, check mark, and move toward Christ. That's what this is all about. When we move toward Christ, we're finding healing, and, uh, and that's what this is all about. That's what this first step of forgiveness is as we journey on in Lent today. And so, I don't want to beat this bush too hard. I don't want to, you know, just, it's really hard to dog on ourselves for, for forgiveness, but There's one insight from our scripture lesson today that I really want to point out. You notice the others? You remember the others in the scripture, the tattletales? You know, the people who watched the whole thing happen. They they were sitting there and and they saw the forgiveness, the great debt. You know, my Bible translated it as to $100,000. Another translation put it as 20 years of minimum wage labor is what this guy owed. And he was a minimum wage worker. And then he owed, what was owed to him was like, I don't know, a day's wage or a week's wage by comparison, 20 bucks, maybe. So we can see the, the, the discrepancy and we can see, obviously, that it was wrong. And so can everyone else around us. This is still true today, that Jesus offers us forgiveness. We know that and people outside the church know that. So when we refuse to offer somebody forgiveness, they're like, what the heck? That's not what, the way this is supposed to go. And this is still true. This is so true. According to a, uh, a study published in, in a novel called Unchristian by a couple of statisticians, 87% of Americans say today that the church is judgmental. Man, that just, doesn't that hurt your heart a little bit? It hurts mine. Because whatever happened to know they, whatever happened to they will know us by our love, Right? We're supposed to love mercy and just kind of and do justice. We have the equation flipped. We should be overbalancing it with forgiveness. Just imagine what would it look like if we didn't operate from a self-serving kind of justification for our actions all the time? What would happen if we took the first little baby step of offering forgiveness? Maybe a solution would actually start to come out. Instead of saying you're wrong, we could say, well, maybe I'm wrong. And watch how the conversation actually moves to something productive. So we all get that we should be doing forgiveness. That's, that's the thing. We, I, I, I hope that's pulled a heartstring this morning. And so I, I want to lift up two particular teachings of Jesus that I think are extra helpful because forgiveness is hard, isn't it? That's why we all laughed when we said, today's about forgiveness. Are you ready? I'm not. Forgiveness is hard. And so the first teaching of Jesus that I'd like to lift up is, uh, is found in Matthew 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount, verse 39. And so we have it up here. It's, uh, we can summarize this as turn the other cheek, right? We've heard this lesson before. 
Somebody slapped you, turn the other cheek. So I, I asked Tammy to be a little volunteer, and she's going to come up. So let's, let's give her a little round of applause for stepping out of her comfort zone this morning. But i I got to be serious here. When we start this forgiving process, maybe we just need to pay attention to our initial hurts. When somebody goes to attack us right away, when somebody tries to bully us, students, I hope you're paying attention to this. This is what happens, okay? All right, give me your best shot, Tammy. Micah? Yeah. You need to get your hair cut. <laughs> yes, I, but I like, I like the style. Mm. I, it's, Did you look in the mirror before you left today? Well, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I've been trying. I used some hairspray. I mean, what are you talking about? This is ridiculous. Yeah. Mm. You might want to get it cut. What? That's not fair. I, why? why? You got long hair. Why can't I have long hair? There's differences. What? So you see what can happen really quickly. <laughs> that was good. Thank you. When we react... When we react right away, we just make it, it do you see how quickly, it, it, how quickly it got easy for her, easier and easier for her to make those insults? We're going to try this again. I'm bored. Can you hurry it up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it's long. Why don't you read the Gideon material? Mm. Did you see all the people sleeping? Yeah, I, it's a really comfortable place. I'm glad they can get some rest. Okay. See, she's shut down. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I don't know about you, but did you watch how the power just evaporated instantly? Did the zings still kind of hurt? Yeah. Ouch, Tammy. Um, but, but did you see how the power just evaporated out of that when we turned the other cheek? It begins with offering immediate forgiveness. That's what I see is at the heart of that particular verse. And so if you're in a place right now where there's fresh hurts that are coming at you, just turn the other cheek. I know it's hard, and you won't get it right every time, but that's a first very practical step. And for students, that's a very important one in this world of bullying. Just continue to turn that other cheek. Watch how the power evaporates. It's incredible. The next, the next thing that I think is really helpful because I realize some of us have hurts that are so deep that they're maybe unspeakable. It's taught just a little bit later in the same Sermon on the Mount from Jesus in verse 44, Matthew 44. Jesus is teaching us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Admittedly, this is one that I struggle with. And when I first read this verse, when I first came across this particular subject, you know what I thought of when, he, when they said, pray for your enemies? I thought, yeah, God, get them. Do the pillar of fire thing, you know? Just, phew, you know, yeah, I'm a good swimmer. Let them drown or something, you know, what, whatever it is. That's where we start with the prayer, and that's okay. It, that just means we're human. But really, in our heart of hearts, we know where this verse is actually leading. This verse is asking us to start, just start with the baby step of, God, will you be with that person that hurt me? I can't forgive them right now, but will you at least be with that person? Maybe show them the wickedness of their ways. That's an okay prayer. That's a great prayer to start with. And I can tell you, after years and years of praying this prayer for not just one person, but several people that have hurt me in my life, it becomes easier and easier, and you gravitate to this place of, God, I recognize how much I've been forgiven. Will you forgive them? It doesn't erase the hurt, it doesn't erase the wound, but it is the first step toward healing, and it's a very important one. And so, in light of this difficult topic, and thinking about forgiveness, thinking that we should do it, I have a little parable for you. One that is not found in the Bible, but one that really tests the integrity of our forgiveness. It's a Native American parable, and I, I think it's funny, and it really challenges my heart still. So there was a Native American boy who was at top of a mountain, and uh, he was doing the ritual thing or whatever. It was getting cold. He knew he needed to come down because he would die. And on his way down, he came across a rattlesnake. And the rattlesnake would, was going to freeze to death as well. And so as he was walking by, the rattlesnake said, will you save me? Will you carry me down the mountain? I'll never make it in time. And the boy said, no. Why would I carry you down the mountain? You'll bite me. And the rattlesnake pleaded and said, have mercy, please, 
carry me down the mountain. If you carry me down, I promise I will not bite you. This is what this rattlesnake said. And so the little boy, having trust, having honor, picked him up and carried him down to the valley. And as the little boy sat him down on the rock in the warm valley, this rattlesnake lunged and bit him. And as the boy, realizing that death was intimate, immediately in his face, he looked at the snake and said, why did you bite me? You promised you wouldn't. The snake said, you knew what I was when you picked me up. Man, that's a hard story for me. Because I know some snakes out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I was pointing up, not, not Tammy. But really, we're not dealing with talking snakes, we're dealing with people. Was what the boy did good? It was very good. He saved a life. Imagine the power of saving a life, how incredible that is. Was what the snake did wrong? Yes, it was very wrong. But see, again, we're not talking about talking snakes. We're talking about real people with the ability to change, with the ability to have the transformation of Christ in our lives. And when we take this baby step, this first step of forgiveness, even though it feels like it's 10,000 miles uphill, we can begin the healing process just as Jesus Christ did himself when he began to heal the entire world, all of creation. As Jesus was hanging there on the cross, the first mile that we're looking at, the first moment that we're looking at this season of Lent is his first moment on the cross where he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. In that single instance, in that very moment, healing began for all of us. And maybe you're thinking, I don't even know how to forgive myself. Then you need to focus on this particular verse. Jesus is willing to admit that you didn't always know what you were doing and you can't get it right every time. But he's here to rescue you and help you with the first step of forgiveness. There's power in forgiveness and I really think the solution isn't offering another opinion. It's just simply Realizing that forgiveness opens up the possibility to heal our wounds, to heal our hurts, and to live a little bit more like Jesus lives and loves. Let us pray. Father in heaven, today we, we humbly come to you. Hopefully you have done a work in each and every one of us to realize that forgiveness is not just something that we kind of do, but it should be the number one thing that we offer that sometimes it's the point, not the byproduct. And yes, Jesus, we can focus on the fact that you command us to forgive, but Jesus, you're not about the legalism of it. You want to show us how forgiveness will transform us. And it doesn't always take the hurt away, and for many of us, there will always be a deep scar. We will always feel the bones ache when we think of that person and the way that they hurt us. But Jesus, right now, with whatever we have, like you have forgiven us, we want to begin this process. And maybe we can't forgive them for the big thing that they did, but maybe we can forgive them for not showing up to dinner. Maybe we can forgive them for something else. Maybe we can understand that they're human too. That's what we ask for now. And more importantly, Jesus, we realize we can't give what we don't have. We cannot give what we don't have. So this moment now, Jesus, we ask that you come into our lives and help us recognize that nothing but your blood will wash us clean of our sins. Nothing but your body will close the gap between us and heaven. So we submit to you now that you are our savior. And we are a people in need of forgiveness, consistent forgiveness. Help us to love, but Jesus, we know even in those loving acts, we're going to mess it up. So thank you for closing the gap. Thank you for providing healing. I ask that you be with each and every one of us now as we consider that holy act. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.